Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 15, 2016, and this is the week in the end charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And if you have to leave early, the, the shows are recorded, and they'll be up on YouTube oh, a few hours after the show is done. It takes about an hour or two to process and then get them loaded and on. All right, what do we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, your questions on trading and your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks if you don't mind until we get to the charts. And once we do get to the charts, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many stocks as you want. Just ask about a stock. Put the ticker in and hit return. Uh, what are we going to talk about this week? Well, a wise trader knows. And that's going to make a lot more sense in a minute. So let's just get this disclaimer out the way. As you know, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I'm probably the last person in the United States to get around to watching Game of Thrones. And a friend of mine insisted that I watch. He's like, oh, man, it's like got these complex plot lines and character development. And, and he went on to say, he goes, and if you see a hot chick in the movie – you're going to see her boobies. And so it's like, okay, well, that's that wasn't the main reason that I wanted to get into it. But certainly that was a good selling point. And once I got into it, and I try to avoid binge watching anything, but I really got into it. And so far I'm getting into it. So don't ruin it for me. I'm only about uh, three or four seasons in. But one thing that I really enjoy is the logic and the wisdom. There's this wisdom of ages and this logic and a lot of uh, really good quotes that I picked up on in the show. And the last one I watched, this is uh, Tywin Lannister. And he's the richest man in the kingdom. And he's grooming a young king to become king. And basically he's grooming the young king to manipulate the young king, is knowing, knowing Tywin as we do. But he said a wise king knows what he knows and what he doesn't. And I think that if you substitute the word traitor for king, and that pretty and that will pretty much sum up trading. So a wise trader knows his methodology. And a wise trader knows the ups and the downs of the methodology. Now, it's not my way or highway. But admittedly, I do like to pick on the reversion to mean guys. And, and and maybe it's because I've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. And there's a two-drink minimum on on that story there. And trust me, it ended very badly, uh, not only for me, but for a lot of other people involved. And it was a very, uh, very bad time. So maybe I'm a little biased because I had a bad experience. But from what I could tell, I think everyone eventually will have a bad experience. Now, the reason I, I think I pick on reversions to mean so much traders is because maybe, maybe because I've had a bad experience, but also because it's very easy to, to explain the whole thing. My methodology is a very simple methodology, but the nuances can be a little bit more intricate to explain. And I'm going to get into quite a bit of that in just a few minutes, but reversion to mean is pretty easy to explain. And I'm going to explain it to you in just one second. And there are also so-called income-producing strategies. And I guess you could probably throw selling options into this, too. And they can work quite well until they don't. So you have this little money-making machine that consistently and accurately provides you with small profits. And that's very uh, – it has this allure to it. And people are drawn to it. And it just – if, if you're like me, you've probably signed up for some other people's newsletters or gotten yourself on some uh, marketing to where you're getting this stuff in your inbox. And I get quite a bit of things in my inbox from, from other traders. And one of the biggest things that I find I get is this, this income, uh, steady income machines that just keep coming week after week into my, into my inbox. And you got to realize if it were that easy, if you were, if you did have some sort of guaranteed income, then all you'd have to do is just do that and put all your money into that. And it would grow and grow and grow and the income would make income and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. You will be consistent. You'll be accurate. A lot of people are drawn to that. A lot of people focus on accuracy. 
And that's something I'm going to talk a little bit about in just one second. Unfortunately, you eventually get creamed in the Talib black swan type of event. And provided that you survive financially, a lot of times you can get wiped out with just a few trades. You have to pick up the pieces emotionally. And that can be really, really tough for a lot of people. So it's kind of easy to pick up the reversion to the bead people, uh, guys, because it's very easy to the, – the methodology, not the people who trade the methodology, but the methodology itself because it's very easy to see the problems. And the problems there are very, very blatant. And it can be equated to like an anthill. Ants can build a fairly significant mound, little pieces at a time, but all it takes is one big footprint, bam, to wipe it down, to knock it out. Now, this is kind of interesting. Uh, I recently noticed that one of the more well-known reversions to the mean players is now a trend follower. So it, this got me to thinking, isn't that ironic, don't you think? Now, the other thing, I guess I shouldn't preach too much against reversion to the mean trading because I'll tell you flat out, I get more clients from reversion to the mean traders, okay, then, then all other methodologies combined. A lot of people go out, they try to do reversions to the mean, and then they get whacked, and then they realize, wait a minute, this really seemed pretty good on the surface. The map, unfortunately, is not the territory. The map is not the territory. No, we're not going to name call, so you can't ask. I'm not going to talk about who or what. But, yes, I've, I've gotten some clients from, from other uh, – people <laughs> let's just leave it at that so i think that's kind of ironic uh someone or some ones i should say who are like anti-trend follower following they finally come around to trend following and i just think that's kind of an interesting thing now i'm going to digress a little bit i have a brother-in-law named andy and, and andy's a great guy i love andy uh, we see him a couple times a year. We uh, get together. We drink some beer. We have a good time. And uh, we just have a blast together. And we do a lot of guy stuff, you know, shoot guns and things like that. And he's really a good guy. He's incredibly successful, just all around great guy, great, great father, great family man. But he does have a little bit of a quirk. He's guilty of what I have dubbed Andy. And Andy will ask for your opinion on something. And then when you give it to him, he's not only going to tell you how wrong – that you're wrong, but how wrong you are. So I've done that Andy. And it's actually caught on within my family. My uh, daughter will come up to me, my youngest at least especially, and she'll say, Dad, and she'll ask me something. And I'll just kind of look at her. She goes, look, I'm not Andying you. I really want to know what you think. So – one thing that I often talk about, and I'm not necessarily picking on this one individual because I've seen this time and time again. This is just one example. But when someone sends me their trading system, and if you're thinking about doing that, don't, okay, unless you send me a, a $1,000 deposit for, let's say, I'll give you two hours consulting, and, and be prepared for me to rip you a new one, okay? If you want to get into that, that's fine. But I don't want to get into helping you build the system. I've spent 20-something years building my own system, and it's taken me a long time to do that. So we're, we're not going to be able to build your system overnight. And by the way, why reinvent the wheel after I spent all this time working on something? Maybe take a look at what I have. But I digress. So people will occasionally send me systems, even though I encourage them not to. And I'll say something like this. This is kind of how the conversation goes. Look, you had a 50% drawdown. And since a hypothetical system is based on 100% hindsight, in other words, they curve fit the data to the past, your biggest drawdown is yet to come. I told a, a mechanical trader that once, and he got pissed off at me. He said, well, you know, because everything's in hypotheticals and, uh, and, and the future is uncertain, your biggest drawdown is ahead of you. He got all mad at me. It's like, well, pfft. if you do, that you would never have your biggest drawdown was not in, ha in front of you. Then you, just, you could, again, sell all your assets, put everything to that because it would be like a guaranteed money-making machine. So when I told this individual, look, you lost half your money in a year, roughly, 
He came back with, yeah, but by the end of the year, it actually ended in the black. Well, how many of you could lose half of your account and keep on trading and think, well, I'm just going to keep on doing this because it'll come back. And that's going to be very difficult to do. And I promise you, if you're running money, unless you're a certain value player out there who nobody holds accountable for anything, I'm not sure why, but that's another story. But if you're running money, I could guarantee you that you will not keep a client if you lose half of their money. But even on a personal level, could you really lose half your money and keep on plodding away at it? Probably not. So in theory, keep it a slide from last week in here. We did a thing on yogi last week. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In reality, they are not. Now, keep in mind that I am not holier than thou. My stuff is not without its nuances. And as, I've alluded, as I alluded to a little while ago, we probably don't have enough time to get into all of them, but I do want to talk about some of them. Now, I was actually told by a mentor after I gave a speech once, he says, hey, Dave, you got to you gotta get rid of that word streaky. Find another word because it sounds too elusive. Well, it can be streaky. You, you print money for a while, and then you go back to grinding it out. And here's the deal. If I could ever solve for that, you would never see my fat ass again, okay? And I'm working on it, but I realize that it's a grail hunt. It will be streaky. You'll make a lot of money over a short period of time. You'll make a lot of money, as you'll soon see, within a few positions. And that's crucial. And that's really tough for many because they give up right before the next big trends come along. And they also sharpshoot signals, which we'll talk about in one second. Brian Gelber, and I think it was the first market wizard, says, this is my view of a year in the life of a trader. And I think this is more of a trend follower type of trader, reading into it a little bit. Four out of 12 months, you're hot. You're so excited that you can't sleep at night. You can't wait to get to work the next day. You're just rolling. Two months out of the year, you're cold. You're so cold, you're miserable. You can't sleep at night. You can't figure out where the next trade is going to come from. And then the other six months out of the year, you make a lose and make a lose. And that pretty much sums it up. You could probably move the uh, add three months in one case and four months in another and mix it up a little bit. But for the most part, you do tend to dry, grind it out. It grind it out, and you have to really hang in there, and then, bam, you start making a lot of money. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but I've seen the flip side happen. More often than not, I see people, and it doesn't have to be my methodology. It could be any methodology, but I have more experience, obviously, with my methodology than other people's. But I see people come in, and they hit a few bad trades, and then they just immediately give up. Well, if you do that on every methodology, you're never going to reap the fruits of your labor. Now, while I was working on this and talking about the importance of chipping away at it, I received an email from someone. I said, hey, look, uh, your subscription's up for renewal. Uh, are you going to renew? I see you're still logging in. What do you think? And one of the things he said was, I took some of your trades and couldn't make any money well there's your problem I can't make money either on some of my trades so I just grabbed went back to the closed trades I think this is all the closed trades for 2016 thus far and again I probably should talk about the the losing aspects okay the negatives but I can't make money on some of my trades either. There's a losing trade. There's a losing trade. This one had a little discretion, but for all intents and purposes, at least mechanically, it was a losing trade. And this was another losing trade down here. So if you're just sharpshooting the signals, and that's a word I borrowed from Greg Morris, because Greg did spend some time uh, in retail, and that was the big problem that he saw is that, 
a lot of people sharpshoot signals, and, and I fully agree with him because I was talking about, uh, we were talking about this a while back. And in addition to those trades you just saw, some were mediocre, some were losing. It's also a game of outliers, and this is kind of that streaky thing that comes into play that makes it seem a little elusive at time. At times, but like last week or week before, whenever I said it, I forget exactly. The thing that's kind of strange about the methodology that I can't solve for is, is you never know when your next big winners are going to come along, but they do. And they do usually just set about the right time. And kind of like, as Mr. Galber said, after you're kind of like really cold and you're wondering if they're ever going to come along. And they do. And I quote Mark Douglas almost weekly, uh, the late, great Mark Douglas. And I like what he said. He attributes it to trading. He attributes it to be like being a salesperson. And a bad salesperson makes a couple of sales calls, gets rejected, gets bummed out, and goes, drinks his lunch. A good salesperson makes a couple of sales calls, gets rejected. And what does he do? Well, he goes grab a cup of coffee and he goes right back to the phones, takes a little break, and then centers himself, takes a deep breath, grabs the phone and starts calling again. Why? Well, he's got those bad leads out the way, and he knows that if he keeps chipping away at it, he's going to get to those good leads. And that's the reoccurring thing to see over and over. And it, it stresses me out to see clients come in – and have a rough patch at it, or sharpshoot signals, or whatever, and then quit, and then what happens right after the market begins to trend again? Or even if it doesn't begin to trend, we start finding some really good setups once again. So, so these are the ones we are waiting for. We're in longer-term trend-following mode on these setups. Uh, this is the hypothetical portfolio. If you want a snapshot of the open portfolio, which will look something like this, or I might have a little bit older one, I'll be happy to send that to you. Uh, just let me know. Shoot me an email. And I'm not going to go through the details of this because we've done it so many times, but the, the trades are divided into a swing trade loaf into a trade following loaf. So you can see on the hypothetical 100K account, there's $2,000 of this trade open profits, and there's about roughly $5,000 of open profits in this trade. If it's yellow, it means the trade is still open. If it's white, it means it's partial profits have been taken out. So you can see if you look at this number down here, that's a pretty good number, especially when you, that's based on a 100K account for open trade. So if you add up those winners and losers and you add in these two big, nice outliers, these are the ones we've been waiting for, right? Then you're not doing so bad. But if you – and let's see if we can go back to the, the slide. If you took those losing trades and maybe one or two of those mediocre trades – then you really didn't do so hot. And again, that's a problem I see over and over and over. It bums me out. And there's nothing I can do about it other than lecture to you week in and week out. Now, along the lines of nuances, it really is a methodology of patience. And there's a variety of patience. And as I often say, by the way, if I had a choice between someone who's extremely patient and someone who's smart, I would take the patient person any day of the week. But it is a methodology of patience in two ways. Sometimes you have to sit and sit and sit and wait and wait and wait for some decent setups. Just recently, and I'm getting a little further ahead of myself, but I'll go ahead and just get it out of the way now. But just recently, I couldn't hardly find a setup to save my life. In fact, last night I didn't write down any new setups, so we have one setup that's still working, but I didn't find any new setups at all and nothing new to even look at in the Landry list. Just to, I just basically ended up with the list from the day before. So I get a little performance anxiety when this happens, especially since I have clients depending on me to come up with something, right? And that was a little hard early in my career because when I was back – way back in the trading market days when the earth was still cooling, we had salesmen, and, or they had salesmen, and, and the salesman would call me and say, Dave, you got to start recommending something, anything. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to recommend anything just to be recommended it. But I found that if I was recommending crappy stocks, we didn't lose 
clients. But when I would stop recommending anything and say, hey, guys, we've got to sit on our hands and preserve capital, go through that capital preservation mode. Return of capital sometimes is more important than seeking return on capital. We would lose clients. So the salesman would literally call me and beg me to put something in, anything. So sometimes it is a methodology of patience, but long story endless, getting back to what I was talking about a minute ago, couldn't find a setup to save my life, feeling that performance anxiety, and what happens? Bam, we have the crash, or whatever you want to call it. The media makes it sound a lot, I shouldn't use the word crash. We had the correction last Friday. And so it's kind of like, okay, well, now I know the rest of the story. Now I know why I haven't saw anything for a while. And it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to look at the S&P 500 and look at the net net gain. Where is it now? Where was it a couple of months ago, which we'll spend a lot of time looking at in just one second. So it's a methodology of patience waiting for that trade. And it's also a methodology of patience and sticking with the trade when you finally do get it. Uh, last week's Kurt report referenced Brett Steenbarger, and he's he's got a lot of good psychology stuff, uh, and, and I probably should read it more than I do. Um, I'm, I'm always nervous about reading somebody else because I don't want to sound like them, uh, and I want to make sure everything I do is mostly original, but some good stuff over there. So check those out, and from that, I got, you will define your poker greatness, not by the hands you play, but by the hands you fold. And that's Dan Reed. You have that framed on your wall? Do you really, Jill? Do you actually play poker or is that just, a, uh, you just have that to, uh, to remind you for trading? This is awesome. Wrong thing. Okay. <laughs> she has something framed on the wall. It's probably just it's probably a picture of me, I guess, huh? No. <laughs> Keep the roaches out. By the way, did you guys hear the the uh the, the outtake? <laughs> had a big roach drop on me as I was doing the uh, or drop right next to me as I was doing the weekend uh the uh marketer minute this morning. But anyway, you would find your poker greatness not by the hands that you play, but by the hands that you fold. And that folding is twofold, okay? And this is what I alluded to a second ago. Sometimes it's better to be on the dock wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on the dock. And I don't want to get into the story because I've told it too many times. And I don't want to bore you, but I've almost, we almost sank in the middle of Atlantic once. And, and it would have been pretty ugly because I don't think we had enough room in the life raft. Uh, water was fairly cold and the seas were pretty rough. But that's a story for another day. That's a, that's a, you don't even have to buy me a beer for that story. Uh, anyway, so sometimes it's better to be on the dock wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on the dock. And by that, I mean it's pretty nice having not a few – just uh, just a few stocks in the open portfolio and not having put on a whole bunch of new stocks coming into a market like last Friday. It doesn't always work that well, but usually if you pay attention – careful attention to the database, and I know it's cliche, but pick the best and leave the rest, and you just simply don't play. Don't, don't, you know, fold your hand before it even, uh, before it even begins. And then the other thing you could do, the other folding is, when you get stopped out, you get stopped out. As I just showed you, and I'm often told, Dave, why do you spend so much time telling everybody you could lose? Well, it's the reality of it, you know, and I'm thinking in the long run, Selling reality is going to work a lot better than selling, and I quote, make $10 million in 10 minutes a day. But as I wrote in layman's, by the way, if you, you guys need a PDF of that, I'll, uh, I do have it on my website now uh, on the, uh, in the store. So if you're looking for that, uh, I do have that there, and I'll eventually put a banner ad up on the site. But as I said, in layman's, uh, fairly early in my trading career, I walked into the gym with a long face. I know some of you are probably laughing that I actually went to a gym, but I I I've n I don't think I've missed an annual workout in in 30 years. Anyway, so I walked into the gym. I was a little bummed out, and the receptionist knew me, and she's like, uh, "Why the long face?" And I'm like, "Uh, I'm in a bunch of bad stocks." And she said, "Well, why don't you sell them and buy some good ones?" And I'm like, Arr. "I kind of growled at her a little bit." <laughs> I got to thinking about it over the next few weeks, months, years. Like, 
man, she was right. I'm thinking, I got an MBA. What is she now? I got a degree in computer science. Uh, she can't read a chart. I'm like, well, maybe she can. So sometimes folding means getting out of those bad stocks. Now, when I was writing this piece that I'm going to publish tomorrow, I, uh, I think it was yesterday or day before, those three stocks in the portfolio, all three were profitable. So we had 100% profitable stocks in the portfolio. And, and as I'm going to write in the piece, I wasn't saying that to brag. I was saying that because the reason we were able to do that was because we let the losers stop out. We folded on those losers. So we sold the bad stocks and kept the good ones is what we did. So she wasn't too far off in her thinking on that. Jill has patience is power. Patience is not an absence of action. Amen. Rather, it is timing. It waits on the right time to act for the right principles and in the right way. Fulton Sheen. I'm going to make a note of that. I'll have to um, quote you on that or quote Fulton on that. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Now, getting back to the wisdom of trading, a wise trader knows himself. And I'm not going to go all Sun Tzu on you, but it is it is pretty good stuff. And I, I was trying to find my book. I've actually given that book out many times over the years to friends who are struggling in, in one way or the other. Not, not much trading-wise, but just in life. And it's a good book for life, too. It's a little book. It's not that very big. But uh, Sun Tzu was a famous general. And he said, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gain, you will also suffer defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So the knowing the enemy, and I hate to make the market the enemy because it's such a negative framing. But the market's not out to get you. The market's not going to come knock on your door and put a gun in your head and make you make a trade, right? It's you. But if you understand markets, if you understand your methodology, if you understand here it goes, here it go again, it's going to be streaky, then you can live with it. Then that print money phase comes along, you'll say, ah, okay, there it is. Now I'm, I'm doing really well. And then the rest of the time, you're like, well, I just have to grind it out, and that's okay. I'm not going to seek action or try to do something crazy. I'm just going to keep grinding it out. So knowing yourself is, is, is the tough part of this the money management is fairly mechanical the methodology once you begin to understand this fairly mechanical my friends that trade in a more mechanical way I tell them they're a little bit more discretionary traders than they think they are and they tell me I'm a lot more mechanical than I think I am I think I'm a can I think I'm discretionary a discretionary trader but a lot of things I do are mechanical and I think a little bit of oh yeah, a little there's a little bit of both in there. There's a little truth in both of those. But you have to obviously really know your methodology, whatever that methodology may be. Now, if if you're successful trading reverses to mean, don't let me mess you up. Just know that sooner or later you're gonna get whacked and make sure you can survive that that getting whacked. I I I did I do know of uh, an engineer that trades reversion to the mean. The engineers seem to really like reversion to the mean trading for some reason. I guess because it's a, uh, I don't know what I don't know why that is. They're just attracted to it. It makes sense to them. But he actually uses stops and and he has a, a serious money management plan in place. So um, I haven't talked to him in years, so I don't know if he's got that occasional to leave thing that's happened lately to him. But so if you could totally wrap your head around it, then fine, do it. But just know. Know the enemy. Know that these bad things can happen. And then know yourself. Know how you're going to react to them when they do. So, and, and knowing yourself, and I was looking for the quote from Peter. Somebody emailed me. It was it was the fodder. It was fodder for an entire article, which was published in Traders Magazine. Which I think, yeah, it's actually if you go to free reports. I took down the banner ad this morning, but. Uh, just go to store and scroll down or shop now on my website. Scroll down the free reports. It's there. It's called Do the Right Thing. 
And that was inspired by someone who emailed me and she says, you know, I feel like Peter. I know that I shouldn't be doing these things, but I do them anyway. And that's, if you do a little digging, that's, that's in the Bible somewhere. And I couldn't find it before the show. I know I have the quotes written uh, on my computer, but I can't find it or in a graphic. So you have to know yourself and you have to know if you're doing the wrong thing, but doing it anyway. And I'll try not to go too long on this because I talk about it so much, but whenever somebody calls me and they're like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I, I'm a little, I'm a little stressed out thinking like, okay, well, if, if they don't know what's going on, how am I going to fix them? And, um, and it's like, well, what do you think you're doing wrong? And then I'll, they'll immediately come back with, I'm not honoring my stops. I'm cutting my losses. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm cutting my winners short. I'm micromanaging. I'm trading when there really aren't any opportunities. I'm trading for action. And then, as I often say, it's like the doctor, doctor joke. It hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. And then any time when they don't tell me what they're doing wrong and I look at what's going on, I can usually find out pretty quick. And as the example we gave earlier, I made money on some. I didn't make any money on some of your trades. Well, I don't make any money on some of my trades either. So at that particular case, their problem was they're sharpshooting the signal. So they they think the whole methodology is a failure. And it, quite frankly, it fails miserably at times. I, I, I'm the first to admit that. But each methodology or every methodology is going to have its nuances, okay? But the problem there was obviously sharpshooting the signal. So recognize a problem is it take, is a big step towards fixing it like anything in life and i'm not going to go into a long diatribe on this because we've covered it so many times in the past but if you watch a weekend chart you'll you'll catch on that, I, that this is a reoccurring theme there are some things that you could do that's that's fairly easy to help you follow the plan um case in point uh, and I'm going to pull it up now, which is probably a bad idea, but just for example purposes. No, nope, not working. Um, I I shut down my screens before I started the show, uh, specifically my Forex screens, because if I'm watching the show, I'm going to have likely a negative observation, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. There's a 75% chance that I'm going to have a negative observation, and that's going to affect me. But usually I make the most amount of money when my screens are off and, and a lot of times when I'm physically away from the office. So if you're physically away from your screens or your screens are off, you can't micromanage. If you have a stop in place, you have a stop in place. Gets hit, gets hit, okay? Uh, what, what did Peter Tosh once say? You know, pick yourself up, dust your stuff off, start all over again. So find ways to physically remove yourself from the situation. Uh, play little games if you have to. And then, as I often say, if you're micromanaging yourself out of every single trade or if you're getting in and or getting in early and staying around too long and cutting your losses short or whatever, cut your – I keep saying losses short. Cut your winner short. Cutting your losses short is actually a problem too, okay? A lot of times in the service, we'll be down – a half a percent i'm sorry like one percent on a whole trade and people are like well why don't we just bail out this this stock is not going anywhere well let's just follow the plan a lot of times not all the time but a lot of times that stock will eventually take off again and one example i often talk about is the we had a stock that got bought out but it, it triggered and it went sideways for a month and then it got bought out well i guarantee you 90 percent of whoever took it First of all, I guarantee you half the people didn't take it or more, probably 90% of people didn't take it in the first place because it was sharpshooting signals. And then of those 10% that took it, probably 90% of them bailed out right before it took off because they cut their they cut their losses short, okay? Cut their losses short before it hit the determined risk. In other words, they micromanage. So find ways to physically remove yourself from your screens or turn off your screens 
And then also, and, and this was a fodder for our entire columns and weekly charts uh, already. Just for the next trade and only the next trade, plan it out carefully. Now pick the best to begin with, but plan it out carefully. Your entry, your stop, your initial profit target, and then your trailing stop. Plan all that out ahead of time and then follow the plan. Okay, and if you can't do that on one trade, maybe you should be trade. But if you could do it on one trade, it proves that you have what it takes to be a trader. Then do it on the next trade, the next trade, the next trade, and just keep rinsing and repeating. He who knows others is wise. He who knows himself is enlightened. Thank you, Donald. That's Lao Tzu. Is that the same as Sun, Sun Tzu? Now, getting back to Tywin Lannister's quote, and knows what he doesn't, okay? And that's the hard part in this business is the unknowns, and there's a lot of unknowns, okay? The, the main one, obviously, is you don't know what the market's going to do next, okay? So no one knows what happens next, and that's what stops and entries are for, okay? So... Provided, of course, and I often say garbage in, garbage out, you pick the best stocks to begin with or best markets to trade for more efficient markets or best setups in more efficient markets, I should say. Then let the entries and let the stops, let the entries get you in, let the stops take you out. I know I feel like a, I feel like a, I'm always beating a dead horse and a broken record. But I, I'm just always shocked by how many people simply won't wait for an entry. Okay, we'll have a stock set up. We have an entry and rallies a little bit, and then the stock implodes, okay? Well, somewhere around here, I get an email. Hey, Dave, that stinker you recommended. And I know I say this almost every week, so bear with me if, you're, if you've been around, if you've been to these shows. That stinker you recommended, I'm down 50% in this thing. What should I do now? It's like, I never recommended that. Yes, you did. And then finally I go back six months. I go, yeah, I did, but it never triggered. Okay. So waiting for that entry will keep you out of trouble a lot of time. Not all the time, but I'm amazed at how many times it'll keep you out of trouble. And this is hard to quantify, but for every, you've got to make back that loss before you even get back to break even if you enter before a trigger and it doesn't work. So waiting for entries can keep you out of a lot of trouble. And then once you're in the trade, then a stop will take you out if you're wrong. And then you want to take partial profits, obviously, just in case a trend doesn't materialize because you don't know. Again, you know what you don't know, right? And then that trailing stop will take you out when, not if, the trade ends badly, okay? And that's another psychological uh, presentation in and of itself about every trade will eventually end badly. So a wise trader knows what he does and what he doesn't. All right. Um, you guys want to start, guys and girls will start asking about stocks. Uh, feel free to do so now. Uh, I'm still working this beginner's course. I get sidetracked quite a bit here and there, but um, it's going to be really, really good if I say so myself. I'm putting hours and hours of work into it, and it's, and it's kind of a fun thing to do because it makes me go back and think, what do I wish I would have known, have known 20-something years ago? What would I tell that young punk version of me? And it would be more about how to think about markets, about the mentality of markets, your mentality, okay, and knowing yourself, then it would be so much about the markets. The market part is pretty simple, okay? The planning part is pretty simple. Following a plan is where it gets um, a little tougher. Uh, make sure you're uh, at least on the delayed service. So what I'd like to do is if you're on that delayed service, You'll see all the examples that I use. Uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of all the examples come straight from my service in this uh, week of charts. In fact, that's kind of what makes the week of charts 
or a lot of the week of charts. So make sure you at least on the delayed service. You could usually see it about a week or so delayed on the home page of our website, but if you want to look at them every day, and it varies. Sometimes it's only a few days old. Sometimes it might be a little bit more than a week or so because of the depending on what the open portfolio looks like and the open setups more uh, specifically. So if we've got a, some open setups that, are, that haven't triggered yet, then um, I have to wait until those actually trigger before I put it in a delayed service. Somebody, I, I actually have gotten clients from people that says they're making money off the delayed service. So that's kind of exciting, but that's not why, why it's out there. It's, it's out there so you can see these things unfold and you won't say, hey, it's that, that was in hindsight. It's also out there for those who don't have money and want to learn how to trade and for people who are cheap too. <laughs> so. All right, um, let's hop into the overall market. Then we'll get to those um, individual stocks. And any questions or any right it's, right now it's a free for all. Any questions or, or anything we covered so far? Any questions or anything in general? And uh, we'll we'll try to get to the, as much of that as possible. Let's start off with the S and P 500. And this is it's kind of interesting. I was in a webinar the other day, and I don't want to pick on anybody, but they were like, "Well, volatility has been low, but the thing to do was is to sell the low volatility and buy it lower." And I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, that's a pretty scary thing. I would much rather buy volatility when it's low than sell it. So that's kind of a dangerous thing. And the reason that's a dangerous thing is the volatility here is 10 times what it was here. So you could lose a lot of money doing that, okay? But we had the big sell-off on Friday, obviously, and then we snap right back on Monday. Now, my big concern, or not my big concern, my, my thinking was maybe we'll get a fake out below the base like we had a low volatility expansion or expansion from low volatility back here. So if you go in and watch that, we can chart somewhere around early August. It's in YouTube, on YouTube. I talked about the volatility fake out, and I don't want to trade that anymore. I'm not a big fan of short-term systems anymore, but it does test out. And you can see you get the volatility fake out. You go the opposite way, and you got a little pop out of here. I think I wrote about that in the early 90s. Uh, stocks and commodities. A volatility trade in gold is the name of the article. Um, you can get it from stocks and commodities for like $1.99. I don't make any money off of that because um, they originally paid me for the article, and I relinquish all rights. But you could actually – I shouldn't say this, but you could find it on the Internet if you poke around enough. But anyway, all I was doing is looking for a – move one way and then go to the other. I no longer do that volatility type of trading. And now I focus on the swing to intermediate term trading, specifically the intermediate term trading, which comes from a swing trade. Anyway, we had the big drop off or sell off, whatever you want to call it, correction last Friday. But then we had a nice little hookup the next day. Now, let me just show you something real quick. Not a big fan of day trading, but sometimes you can take what I call an intraday position trade where do you see a market have that big gap down? I think it was on this day here. And look for an open gap reversal and then go the other way or go the same way as the open gap reversal. Let me just show you that real quick. And we talk about this quite often in the week of charts. Now, this is not your bread and butter, but sometimes it's one of those um, Jimmy Rogers trades where the market, the money's just lying in the corner. You walk over and pick it up. Um, not big money, but just kind of an S&G type of trade. Let's see if we can get to that day. Talk amongst yourselves. Come on. Oh, you know what? We probably should be looking at the spiders. That's the problem. Whoa, blew up. Okay. I just fat fingered something and it blew up. Well, anyway, in the spiders, the next day they had that nice little opening gap reversal, and it's it's um it is a very tradable type of thing for an intraday position trade. So I'm just throwing that out. I don't want to make uh, day traders out of you, but it is something that sometimes right here you see this little opening gap reversal, and then maybe just take a look at an hourly chart. It might be a little easier to show you what happened there. Right here, you can see 
you come in after the market just gets cream, has its route lower, and then notice what happens. It just it it just gaps lower. And what happens is you have this pent up selling that comes into the market. A lot of business do, doesn't get done. When a market closes on its butt like this, a lot of business doesn't get done. So the next day you'll see that follow through selling. But sometimes it exhausts itself and the market goes right back up. So that's just an SG type of trade. Uh, don't rush out and do too much of that. Be cautious when you do. But you can see it snapped back nicely. So on this day here, I felt pretty good thinking that, well, we just have another one of these volatility fake outs. And boy, that that cream, everyone. And we're going to go back to making new highs. Well, the following day, we had another liquidation market. And by a liquidation market, someone was emailing me saying, Dave, did you notice it was liquidation market? And my answer was yes. That means the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater. It also is kind of a scary thing because it means that people are selling all asset classes across the board and trying to raise capital. Now, they were asking me, should I be concerned? It's like, well, follow through is key. If you keep seeing liquidation markets, then by all means, you need to be concerned. But the bottom line is just pay attention to what's going on in the market and follow along. So the next week, day, we had that opening gap reversal. So, ah, okay, that was a fake out. And then we had, bam, another liquidation type of day. So that's a little scary. And then today we're having a nice day, obviously. So we're up about three quarters of a percent. So, so far, we're kind of hanging in there. And so far, I'm going to go with the fact that we just having a shakeout in here and we're going to make a new leg higher. Now, do I know if that's going to happen? No. A, a wise trader knows what he doesn't, right? But what I like to do is come up with plausible scenarios. And that's one plausible scenario is that this whole thing is just a fake out. And so far, it looks like it's just a fake out. My concern, because there's always something to worry about, is we did pull back into this prior range, number one. So in markets, if you pull back into a range and you stay there for a while, then you're back into the soup, then you're back in this sideways market, then it's a little nervous. Uh, then you get a little nervous as far as at least new positions. But if you just kind of bounce off the top of that range or just kind of probe into it and immediately turn right back up, the market doesn't have a chance to settle in. People don't have a chance to say, oh, uh, this is the new norm. And then they get shaken out in the fake out move and it goes higher. So that's kind of an interesting uh, development there. I'm just kind of I'm kind of glad it's moving. I know it's a little volatile, uh, but volatility, as you know, usually comes back in the fall. Let's take a look at the Nasdaq and then I'll take a look at a couple sectors and then uh, keep the stock picks coming. We'll uh, we'll take a look at those, too. Now, NASDAQ had an okay day yesterday up a smidgen here. Same sort of fake out move. You get a true open on the NASDAQ. So you can see we had that nice little opening gap reversal yesterday. Now, what I've been telling everyone is that if we take out Friday's high, and I guess more specifically, I should say the gap of Friday. So uh, let's say Thursday's low. If we take out Thursday's low, this could be the all clear for the market. Now, check back often. But notice what the NASDAQ is doing so far, up a percent and change. So far, we took out Friday's high. And so far, it looks like it's off to the races. The new leg could be underway. Now, I don't know. Some people say, well, what about election year holding pattern? Well, it could be. Who knows? Okay, it's developing uh, It's developing every, uh, every minute. Um, what's Hillary Clinton's favorite uh, pizza place? Little Seizures? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, Russell 2000 up a percent and change today so far. So far, so good there. My only concern, as I said, the market a minute this morning was that this market just kind of creeped along, creeped along, creeped along, and then bam, lost quite a bit uh, over a short period of time. And that's the problem when you're not making a whole lot of progress. It doesn't take much to wipe it out. But so far, it's coming back fairly well, at least today. And as I've been saying quite a bit, I'd like to see it get through this overhead supply before getting too excited. So we have to wait for follow through in the Russell. Some areas are looking quite dubious in here. We talked about retail not too long ago. Uh, it bow tied down for all time highs. Usually that's not a good thing. Usually that's a sign of, of, the, of the beginning of the end. And but it has pulled back into this support. So very important for retail to get back, um, get off its butt soon and start rallying. Uh, otherwise, we might actually start shorting that sector a little bit. 
we'll just have to wait and see how the market uh, shakes out. But some areas look at okay. Like the semiconductors had a little bit of a knockout move, have a double top knockout look to them. Looks like they're trying to go off to uh, make new highs. And then there are some speculative issues like uh, Pi within the semis. Uh, we wrote about, uh, we I wrote about last week, talked about it, did a presentation on it, um, which are taking off nicely. So there are some stocks that are doing fairly well. Uh, and some, not so much. So the point I'm trying to make is it's, it's a little mixed out there. The energies recently broke out, looking like they had nine lies, and then they came right back in. Uh, I would hold off on the energies. I'm getting a few questions about energies. If you guys want to talk about them today, that's fine. If you want to talk about, talk about some individual issues. But unless you have the mother of all setups with the, in, with the energies trading sideways, I wouldn't rush out and buy a bunch of energy stocks now. Metals and mining looking a little bit worse. Uh, recently bow tied down, not from all-time highs, but – from fairly significant highs, uh, major signals, as you know, as I often say, this is a weekly chart. I look at off of many year highs like that or all time highs like this, and I'm not so worried about them when they're down at these lower levels. But it did begin to bow tie down on a daily nonetheless. So on a minor signal like this, minor signals coming off of multi month or maybe just one year highs. Uh, I don't necessarily rush out and short, but what I might do in a case like that is back off a little bit on on my longs, maybe pulling my horns a little bit. Gold stocks uh, are selling off in here. They're looking a little dubious. Shorter term, bow tie down, so I'm having a hard time getting excited about individual issues. Somewhat longer term, though, take a look at the weekly. They're just kind of making that uh, correction on a weekly chart off of multi-year lows, 10-year lows maybe, maybe even longer, 14, 15-year lows. So that's pretty good so far. But make sure you have the mother of all setups here because the, the daily trend is beginning to turn. The daily trend will, will turn long before the weekly trend, okay, turns. And that's why sometimes you can't really wait for that weekly confirmation on your trades. Um. As far as the rest of the sectors, let's take a look at a couple of things in here. Gold, the commodity, uh, sold off recently when the market slid. So that's, as I was saying, a liquidation type of market. Kind of sideways in here, though. I wouldn't count gold out just yet, just kind of consolidating. I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy it uh, unless it broke out to new highs and then I played some pullbacks along the way. Uh, oil has been uh, – in a bit of a slide lately, it's kind of sideways. It still looks like it's making a big picture, longer term bottom, but I would hold off until we have some evidence that it does maybe wait for it to get above the prior peak in here. So that's oil uh, bonds is the other thing I want to take a look at. And then the rest of the sectors are pretty mixed throughout. Um, and it, anything, by the way, interest rate sensitive, as you would imagine, such as let's take a look at them real quick. Utilities, uh, look at a little dubious in here and also things like the REIT, uh, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts, uh, are also looking a little bit uh, dubious. I don't know if I have any in here to show you. No, there you go. Bam. You can see real estate's kind of rolled over in here. So all assets class, all asset classes got whacked. The interest rate sensitive issues got whacked especially hard lately. And we did have a bit of a liquidation market recently too, especially check out the bonds. We had the gap down day and then we had this big down day here with the overall market turn right back down. So very, very mixed out there. Uh, this light, latest sell-off shows that there is some skittishness out there, if that's a word, uh, some some potential panic out there. Um, that's why it, it shows why it's usually a bad idea to sell low volatility, thinking that you're going to buy back even lower volatility because all it takes is one big spanking like this to uh, eradicate that. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and uh, open up for questions. Uh, without bore you, the rest of these too late. Oh, sorry. Uh, without without uh, getting into a lot of details, the rest of the sectors are mixed for now. So it's kind of a market where I'm kind of paying attention, more attention to the overall indices. Sometimes you spend a lot of time focusing on the sectors and the individual stocks. And right now, I think we need to kind of focus on the indices and see where they're headed. Uh, light. Okay. Light looks good. Waiting for a pullback. Yeah. You answered your own question. Uh, fantastic looking stock. Uh, nice new highs there. Accelerating higher. Nice persistent trend. So yeah, make sure that's on your momentum list. And it is on mine too, by the way. Uh, someone was saying that I'm always beat them up on their stock picks in here. Well, keep in mind that 
the last year or two, if you've only been in these shows for the last year or two, we really haven't had that many stocks to pick from. It's really been a super duper stock selection market. Or you really had to be really picky in your stock picking. So I'm not picking on you by not liking your setups. It's just that there haven't been a whole lot of setups out there. So don't feel uh don't feel like you don't get it. I mean, Donald, you get it. If you're looking at a stock that looks like that, you obviously know what a trend is. And to those of you who are newer to these presentations, just draw you some arrows on your charts like that. And that's what a trend looks like. Five and Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, let me back the chart out and see if we can pick it apart a little bit. For the most part, it looks pretty good, though. Uh, let's back the chart out. No, I, I can't really argue with this one. Um, it did it did sort of pull back to this prior base. It didn't really get too far past this highs, and it did kind of pull back to this prior base in here. That's about the only thing I can kind of pick apart on this one. If you back the chart out, though, it looks okay. So that's probably that's probably about as good as you're going to find it in this market. So the point I was trying to make earlier, and hopefully I made it, is that you kind of have to frame things within the market too, okay? So based on this market condition, that's that's a pretty good-looking stock. So I'll stop short of giving you a high five and on the high five, on the five and okay anymore. Looks like we have um, looks like we had some link issues again. Um, I guess I'm asking the wrong people, but did anybody have trouble getting in today? Okay. Um, while I'm waiting on an answer for that, uh, any more stock picks? Okay, we'll give it give it one more minute. I guess while we're at an impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm, as I always say, I'm humbled by your appearance, so thank you so much. Uh, I love doing these shows, as you can tell. It's it's a highlight of my week. I have a lot of fun with them, and hopefully, I don't take myself too seriously. <laughs> All right, any more? Going once, Rita. Okay, Rita's kind of interesting. I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to IPOs. First problem I see though is that it is really thin, so you probably want to pass just based on that. But as a private trader, you could sometimes take these thinner stocks. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit more lenient in that. Usually if a stock comes back up to, um, no email reminder was sent for chart show used last week's link. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, go to webinar. We'll sometimes send out a reminder and I usually try to send out a reminder if I'm not too busy working on my slides, uh, because people just simply forget and everybody has a busy life. I know that, but, uh, we're working on that by we, I mean me. Anyway, a little bit low in volume, so be super duper careful there. And usually I'm not a huge fan of stocks that are just getting past their prior peaks, but with IPOs, I'm a little bit more lenient. So I'm going to say it looks okay. Uh, I think I would wait for a little bit more pullback, though, maybe to about 24 or so before going after it if you decide to go after it. But again, I can't emphasize it enough. It's very thin. Okay, any more? Going once, going twice. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here. Any unanswered questions, DavidDaveLandry.com. If it uh, requires a lot of thought and a long answer, I will make it fodder for next week's show. So feel free to shoot me emails. Uh, if not, I'll, uh, I'll fire it right back to you. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again between now and then, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much.